All righty, guys, uh, let's open our Bibles up to Exodus chapter 32. We're going to go back to that law where God was giving the law and the people were being directly in a, or disobedient to the law. You know, you hear uh, Christians a lot of times today saying, you know, we, we must be stronger Christians than the people in the Old Testament were because they, they had these crazy stories, you know, and God spoke directly to them. And, and so if we obey, that must make us stronger Christians than they were. No, that's not the case. See, we have the Holy Spirit now. See, God, when Christ ascended into heaven, he left the Holy Spirit to us to guide us. And so I think we get a lot of confusion in this obedience and, and, and grace, right? We tend to think that obedience to the law is the total opposite of living in grace, and that's just not the case. You see, in God's grace, he gave us his word. He gave us the law. You see, I, I think it's, it should be only outside of the church that we mistake God's law for the overbearing, you must do this, uh, just this confinement to, I hope I'm doing it right. No, you see, that was the way of the law. Today we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, guess what? Guides us to abide by the things that God told us to do then, right? You see, God didn't create all these people and then and come up with some good ideas. I think I'll make some laws, and if they, if they keep the laws, cool, then they get rewarded. If they disobey the laws, then they get punished. No, that's not how it works. You see, God is perfect, right? God is love. God is joy, is peace, patience. Do these sound familiar to anybody? Perhaps the fruits of the Spirit? Right, right, right where Moses was reading from? Those weren't just good ideas that some dude came up with. Those weren't just good ideas even that God came up with. Those are who God is. He's the only one that's able to say, I am. I am everything that each and every one of you desires inherently in your hearts because I created you in my image to return to me. God's the only one who could say that. And so when we talk about obedience tonight, it's not an obedience to the law like you must do this and if you don't do this then you got to sacrifice the lamb and then 613 laws and you better keep every one of them perfectly. No. Most of them it's not even possible to keep anymore. So what we're talking about here in obedience is obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit lead you to do? To follow what God commanded in the beginning. Why? Because he's perfect. He's love. He's joy. He's always leading you to do those things. So in Exodus 32, remember the last time that I preached, we were talking about the Israelites and, and, and how we as Christians are the leaders of the world. Remember Jesus in, in Matthew 5.14 said, you are the light of the world, right? Not a light in the world, you are the light of the world. Christians are the leaders of the world. Amen. Why? Because we state claim to the fruits of the Spirit. We have the only Savior that can get us there. Amen. How many people have tried to find joy in a drug? How many people have tried to find peace through hatred? How many times has it gotten there? None. You see, we as Christians, we have access to the only real true Savior that can get you where your heart desires to be. That is the fruits of the Spirit. And what we were learning in Exodus 32 was that the, the Israelites, uh, they had been given God's word and, and been given this commandment, right? God told them to, well, he told Moses to tell them, you guys stay here at the base of the camp while Moses and the elders come up to me. And then God was actually going to give him the, the written form of his commandments. Now at this point, he had already given them the Ten Commandments, so don't let there be any confusion, right? The timeline, it lines up perfectly. But the Israelites, as they're waiting, remember in Exodus 32, let's read verse 1. It says, when the people saw how long it was taking, how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain. They gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So what was the first thing that we learned from the Israelites? What not to do as the leaders of this world? 
Number one, don't disobey the word of God. Don't disobey the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. So tonight we're going we're gonna to expound on that obedience to God's word. Why is it so important? Are we just a bunch of blind followers of a cult? What is the value of obedience? Why does God want our obedience so badly? And, and not just want it, but require it. Now, first things first, how many people here like an absolute guarantee in life? Like, we like to know that there's no guessing, no question, right? A business owner loves to know that there will be a profit, right? An investor would love to know that this, this investment is going to be an absolute winner, right? Parents would love guaranteed obedient children, right? Amen. Humans, in general, would love Guaranteed love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. These are the things that God has wired us to desire. We may be good at masking it. The, the world may seem dark and full of hatred. That's because the enemy, since day one, has been lying and saying, here, try this. Try this drug. This is the way to get to that joy that God wants you to have. Right? So what if I told you that I could absolutely guarantee the fruits of the Spirit in your life. I can. For three easy payments of one ninety nine ninety nine, And one really difficult payment. Now, we used to listen to a comedian and he talked about the, you know, the, the infomercials, the three easy payments. And like, what if they told you three easy payments and one really hard one? Like, we're not going to tell you which one, but one of these payments is going to be a real pain in the butt. The mailman will get shot to death. The envelope won't seal. Uh, that last payment has to be made in wampum. <laughs> We're not going to tell you which one. But seriously though, what if we could guarantee the fruits of the Spirit in your life? We all want them. We're designed to want them. We were created by the person who embodies those things. It's one word, obedience. What do you know of obedience? What do you know of disobedience? Of the results of either option? We waver on the balances like, is, is the suffering in my life right now, is that because of disobedience? Or are the rewards in my life right now, is that because of obedience? Is it all just random? Or, or is there divine order and purpose in all of it? And tonight we're going to figure it out. What does it mean to obey? What is required to accomplish this obedience? What's the result of obedience? So first off, a definition uh, of the word obedience. Not exactly a mind-bending term here, right? Uh, Nike, just do it. <laughs> In Lake County dialect, get her done. In the past tense, done did it. <laughs> In tongues, obediencia. <laughs> In America, shut up and do it. <laughs> Not exactly a, a, a brain buster here, right? Obedience, simple term. Why is it so hard to uphold? See, anyone can understand the term obedience, but obviously not everyone can do it or we wouldn't have prisons or hell. So what keeps us from upholding such a simple idea? Two things. First of all, the enemy of our souls constantly convincing us to go his way. That is the way which is opposite, opposite of God. And where he is doing that and succeeding, therefore, the absence of the Holy Spirit. You see, the enemy is always working to convince us that disobedience is the better option. He's been doing it since Adam and Eve, right? Since day one. And if you don't believe me, once again, Mark, can you pull that up for me? Uh, Facebook has solved all of the world's problems. Uh, in one simple post. Scroll up to the uh, title there for me real quick, Mark. The entire Bible explained in one Facebook post. Okay? I'm going to read through this with you guys. And this is actually pretty good. Uh, Genesis. God. All right, you two. Don't do the one thing. Other than that, have fun. Adam and Eve. Okay. <laughs> Satan. You should do the one thing. Adam and Eve. Okay. God. What happened? 
we did the one thing. Guys, and then the rest of the Old Testament. God, you are my people, and you should not do the things. <laughs> okay, we won't do the things. Good. People, again, uh, we did the things. God's like, guys. <laughs> and then the Gospels. Jesus says, I am the Son of God, and even though you have done the things, the Father and I still love you and want you to live. Don't do the things anymore. And the healed people say, okay, great, thank you. And the other people, we've never seen him do the things, but he probably does the things when no one is looking. Jesus says, I've never done the things. And other people, well, we're going to put you on trial for doing the things. <laughs> Pilate says, did you do the things? Nope. He didn't do the things, guys. Okay, we'll kill him anyways. Okay. Jesus says, guys, <laughs> really? <laughs> and then Paul's letters, the people, we did the things. <laughs> Jesus still loves you, and because you love him, you have to stop doing the things. Okay, we, we did the things again. <laughs> guys. <laughs> and then Revelation, John, when Jesus comes back, there will be no more people who do the things. In the meantime, stop doing the things. <laughs> See, it's simple and it's silly, <laughs> but is that not it? <laughs> Why doesn't God want you to do the things? Why don't you want your son to put his hand on the burning hot stove so it won't get burnt? So you don't have to listen to him cry. <laughs> That's later. <laughs> That's obedience is better than sacrifice. We'll get to that later. You see, all of this is absolutely true. Just don't do the things. And that was plenty of motivation for Adam, right? That is, of course, until the enemy convinced him and Eve that God was lying and he wouldn't die. You remember, he said, you won't surely die. And I think the way that he said it is, you won't surely die. And Satan is doing this exact thing to each and every one of us, each and every day, with each and every decision. So we see the value in obedience. God's word is perfect. We flat out need a, a way to obey this word and a good reason to obey it, right? Remember Jesus said, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. It, it, it's not enough to just have a strong desire to do the right things, right? How many here have tried that route? I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin. How long does that work? About a week? <laughs> Why? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You can't uphold this thing in your own strength. Uh, when we do these shows with Jamie's dad, we have this guy that comes and speaks, and I'll spare you his name for his own sake, but a motivational speaker. You know, we're at these finance uh, conventions, and they're teaching people how to make more money, make more money, make more money, right? And so this guy comes, and he's, um, well, I'll tell you his, job title. He's the publisher of Success Magazine, okay? So, so well fitted to come and give a motivational speech on how to succeed, aka make more money. So um, he comes in and he's given all these really good principles, which doesn't surprise me at all. The, the universal principles which work in the world, guess why they work? Because God created them. They weren't some dude's good idea. Ethics, that's not some dude's good idea, that's God. So, but he, he's given all these, these good principles, you know, he's talking about uh, if you want your marriage to work out, what has to be the percentage of input from each party, each person in that marriage? And people shout out answers, 50-50, no, 49-51, no, 60 to 40. Not even, 100-0. He says, you have to be willing to put in 100% and expect 0% in return. Unconditional love, anybody? Christ? I just want to shake the guy and say, you're a Christian, did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is he's given all these principles which perfectly line up with, with God's word. He's packaged them as his own ideas, of course. That's how he gets paid. But he's, he's constantly giving you this motivation. Now, now, these principles work, but you're never going to be able to uphold them unless you have the right motivation. Like, 
tape a picture of your sick child on your windshield so that you keep going, right? It's not going to work. And I'm just thinking the whole time, dude, it's going to hurt. It's really going to hurt when this guy runs out of energy and he realizes that he can't do it on his own. You see, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's not enough to just have motivation. I, I can do it. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to sin. But we as Christians, we already have the way to overcome. That's the power of the Holy Spirit alive in each and every one of us since the day we gave our lives to Christ. Amen? Amen. But there's a problem. You see, the Holy Spirit will not at any moment force himself upon us. We still have the choice in every circumstance to either receive his power to overcome or to refuse his strength and fall to whatever the temptation is. You see, it's not just get out of the baptistry and, and, and okay, I'm just a walking holy zombie now. <laughs> That's it. God overcame all of my problems. I don't have to make any more decisions anymore. Nothing. I, I, that's it. The water did it. No, you see, in each and every moment, you still have the choice. Never will God force himself upon you. Never will he make you make the right decision. But he's always there, willing and able to give you the strength, the power to make the right decision. So all the options are on the table, right? Right? As Christians, we have the choice of either Satan's way or God's way at every single moment. Who here wants God's way? Good. So what does it take to get God's way? What does it take to, to obey God's word? The question is, do you trust God's word? Following God's word flat out takes trust. Do you trust God's word to bring you the things that we all naturally desire, the fruits of the Spirit? Or do you trust Satan's way to get you there? If you're the car and the Holy Spirit is the gas, do you fill the car up with gas and get to your destination? Or do you listen to Satan as he's saying, you know, if you put water in the tank, it won't surely kill the engine. Like, you might make it on water. Which do you do? So you naturally desire love. God's word says you must love your enemies. But Satan says hate them. So whose way do you like better? Which one will get you where you want to be? And so we come to the, the reason that we either obey or disobey God's word, faith. You see, the reason you obey God's word is because you have faith that it will get you where you want to go. The reason that you disobey God's word is because you don't believe it'll get you where you want to go. Simple as that. But here's the, the, the complex part of it. It's about to get real simple, though. True faith, it's more than simply agreeing with a concept. See, true faith is believing in a concept so much that you are willing to entrust your entire well-being unto it. You see, Christian or people claiming to be Christians, agreeing with good concepts on Facebook all day long, these little pictures of, of good sayings, right? But then you see their life and they're like, no, nah, they obviously don't live by that saying. See, that's the difference between just agreeing with a concept and truly believing in it. If you truly believe in God's word, you believe enough to entrust your entire well-being to it total, just put my neck out there, God. I hope you're right, right? I hope your way really works. Is it going to? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, let's get real simple. It's like a chair, right? Imagine this was the first time you've ever seen a chair. <laughs> Long time ago, right? <laughs> like, what do you got there? It's a chair. What does it do? Well, it holds you up so you don't have to sit on the ground. Oh, sweet. Well, what do I have to do? Just sit in it. Sorcery. I'm not sitting in it. See, the same is true of our faith in God's ways. If all you're willing to do is agree with the concept of God's word, then you have not truly believed in it, and you will spend your life suffering the consequences. 
See, real Christians don't just agree with God's concepts. Real Christians entrust their entire well-being unto God and therefore experience the fruits of the Spirit as a result of obedience. Like, what have you got there? Oh, it's God's Word. Well, what does it do? It provides perfect guidance in order to attain the things that we naturally need and desire as humans. Oh, sweet. What do I have to do? Just obey it. Not a chance. Right? Obedience to God's word requires true faith in it. And John 14, 1, Jesus said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? It's like Jesus is saying, like, don't be afraid to obey my word, right? <laughs> don't be afraid to win. <laughs> don't be afraid to do things right. See, God's word is it's that winning playbook. We're the only team in the, in the league that has the playbook which wins every single game, right? It's like Jesus is saying, don't be afraid to be, obey my word. If, if by some chance he, he, all of you happen to, I promise you there will be enough room in heaven for you. <laughs> like, don't be afraid to obey his word. Second Samuel twenty two thirty one. you don't have to go there with me, but it says, this God... His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. And then Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. We're talking about obedience here, and I want to see if we can trust God. We're talking about trusting his word and faith in his word. So let's go back to Exodus 32. And I love what we see here in verses 9 through 14. Exodus 32, verse 9. I'm going to read from there through verse 14. Now, at this point, um, God has discovered that the Israelites had Aaron make this golden calf, right? They broke the very first commandment they were ever given, have no gods before me, right? So God knows that. He's sending uh, Moses back down to confront the people. And honestly, God's ticked off. So verse 9 says, Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. O Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give them all of this land that I have promised to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. I've got a question. Do you think Moses really stumped God? <laughs> Like, do you think that, that God said, stand back? And then while he's like leaned over, digging in his God pouch, trying to find his torch or his lightning bolt, Moses is like, no, God, don't do that. Then they'll call you foolish. And then God stands up. He's like, crap. I didn't think of that. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think Moses really stumped God here. See, I think what God was really doing here was showing us that even he obeys the standards which he expects us to uphold. Even he, the creator of the universe. That's how I know I can trust him. Amen? And I'll do you one further here. It's not even a matter of him obeying these principles, these standards, but that he flat out embodies these. That, that these just flow from who he is. That the guidance that he gave the Israelites is out of love and in guidance to love and in safety. See, it's not like God said, all right, I'm going to create these people and then, and then make these rules and if they obey, good. If they disobey, bad. I'm going to punish them. No, God is truth. God is the way. God is life. 
and out of his very being flowed these perfect principles that apply universally. You want the way, you want the truth, you want the life, it's God that you're after and therefore him that you follow. You want disaster and calamity? Cool. Then it's Satan you're after. And it's him and his ways that you follow. You see, I think here's the, the real significance in obedience. God's word, it, it makes all kinds of promises as the rewards for obedience, right? The greatest of which I, on earth, I believe, are the fruits of the Spirit. And I think that we tend to think or perhaps hope uh, perhaps God will give me those rewards even if I'm just sort of obedient or even completely disobedient, right? Like maybe I'll get a go-free pass, right? No, you see, I, I don't think God has the ability to reward disobedience. Not only would that make him a liar, but that would defy the principles that he embodies. You see, you can't go left and get to the place that's on the right. You cannot hate and out of it gain love. You can't turn on the light and still be in the darkness. You cannot live in disobedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit and out of it get the fruits of the Spirit. You see where we've gotten here with this? It's hardly even a matter of obedience anymore. This is simple lo logic, right? Two plus two does not equal five no matter how many times you try. Man plus disobedience to God's word does not equal the fruits of the Spirit, the rewards of obedience to his word. Go to Galatians chapter 5 with me. We're going to look at that exact same passage that, that Moses did. One day I'm going to preach a sermon and, and not use this. But not today. Galatians 5, uh, verse 16 through 25. We're going to read through all of them. Verse 16 says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Jump down to verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Like, don't be surprised when following the, the desires of your sinful nature... Uh, when you guaranteed get these things, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Two plus two equals four. Following the, 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 the leading of your sinful nature equals that. Simple logic. Keep reading, verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Guys, let me remind you, these are the things that you naturally desire. It's not money that you naturally desire. It's not women. It's not a faster car. It's not a bigger house. Those are the avenues that you think will get you to these things, which you truly desire. Those aren't the things that you desire. Love, joy, peace, that's what God wired you to desire. And you only get there in obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to, the, to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Simple obedience. Simple logic. Now something I want to per, uh, point out here. In verse 22 it says, the very first part of it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Other translations say, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now that term fruit there is in direct correlation with the fruit of the womb, right? A child. What? comes. At, this is what the Holy Spirit produces. 
Like, does anybody look at Candy and wonder what she's having? Like, I hope it's a puppy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> How come? Because when man and woman come together, what they produce, there's no question. It's a child. When man and obedience to God's word come together, there's no question what it produces. And when man and disobedience to God's word come together, there's no question what that produces. We've eliminated the question here. We don't have to wonder anymore. Like, what's going to happen if I stick my finger in this plug? <laughs> right? What's going to happen if I eat the fruit? Well, we already know. We've already seen the result. We've got God's word. You see, God cannot... Not just that he won't. There are things that God cannot do, right? God can't lie. God can't make a square circle. And he can't make a rock so big that he can't lift. <laughs> right? There are things that God cannot do. God cannot give you the rewards of obedience when you are living in disobedience. It defies logic not to mention breaks his heart to see you suffering the consequences of disobedience. Back to the stick in your hand on the stove. Why do you tell your child not to stick their hand on the stove? One, yes, absolutely, so you don't have to hear him whine. But I don't think God worries about that much. He's got plenty of whining, right? God tells us not to stick our hand on the stove, so he doesn't have to see us suffer. You see, the Bible in 1 Samuel 15, 20, 22 says, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? It says, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. When you tell your child, don't stick your hand on the stove, you're not kind of like secretly hoping, I hope he puts his hand on the stove. <laughs> right? Just so I can tell him, I told you so. <laughs> no. You genuinely hope that he doesn't put his hand on the stove so that you don't have to see him cry, so that you don't have to see him suffer the consequences of disobedience. God's word says obedience is better than sacrifice, not because he just wants you a marching soldier, but because he wants you living in the, the, the joy of obedience to his word. Amen. You see, these commandments they're no longer, thou shalt not kill. No. They are, when you let me live in you, then you won't kill. When you let me live in you, you won't covet your neighbor's wife. This is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You've heard that stupid saying, oh, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Perhaps the mo most unchristlike goofy saying we can come up with, right? The dumbest thing you could, like, it's okay, I'll just put my hand on the stove and then I'll ask forgiveness. Really? You hear people asking, well, do you think God cares if, like, do you think I can get away with this, like, if I just get close to the burner, will it burn me? You're missing the point. It's your obedience to God's word. That's where the joy is that you're seeking. The joy that you think you'll get by disobedience is not coming. Two plus two equals four, not five. You see, back then, as a requirement of the law, when people did disobey, not only did they suffer the consequences directly of their sin, but they also had to offer a sacrifice. Most of the time it was a, an animal, generally a lamb or a goat. And, and I'm going to try and draw a picture for you here. And it, Imagine literally just this totally innocent animal. Animal's done nothing wrong, right? It was me that sinned. It was me that stuck my finger in the socket, right? But because of my disobedience to God's word, now I have to stand here with this perfectly innocent animal and cut its throat. Sacrifice it to God. God would rather you just live in obedience in the first place, not have to suffer the consequences of disobedience. Amen. So we know what obedience is. Not exactly a brain buster, just do it. 
You know the problem with obedience. It's the spiritual battle. It's Satan over here. No, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. You won't surely die. You might be able to get there with water in the tank. You should try the fruit. See what it'll bring. And then you've got the Holy Spirit saying, I, I don't want to have to say I told you so. <laughs> like I'm giving you the perfect guidance here. Will you not receive it and just listen? It's Satan constantly whispering in one ear and the Holy Spirit in the other, way, other ear. We have the way to obey. As Christians, that's the Holy Spirit constantly giving us the ability to do so, but we have to receive it. He's not going to force himself on you. And finally, you know what it takes to obey. Faith. Real faith in God's word. Not just agreeing with the concept because it looks good on Facebook, but truly believing. True faith in God's word. Faith that says, I'm putting my neck out here all on the line, just trusting in God's word, believing in it, and trusting my own well-being to God's word. The final question is, do you know God's word? Do you know what it is you're supposed to be obeying? Have you read this thing? Do you spend time in it? I think of a football player with the playbook. They spend at least an hour a day learning the playbook just so they can win a stupid football game. Who cares? <laughs> and that's not even guaranteed that that playbook will win that game. Guess what? Ours is. <laughs> I know the ending. We win. <laughs> How can you obey God's word if you don't know it? This part's all on you. I can only lead you to water. I can't make you drink. All I can do is offer you the facts, which are I have lived apart from God's word and suffered the consequences. By God's grace, I'm moving more toward living in obedience to his word every day. And there's no greater place in the world. I've traveled a pretty good part of this country. I've stayed in uh, uh, some of the nicest resorts this country has to offer. I've been to the places most people think they want to be. And I know because I thought that I wanted to be there. I thought that was the life. I thought, you know, you get this, that's it. Like the American dream, just get paid to travel and, and see the world, right? But I've been there. And I've seen that it's all worthless compared to the joy of living in obedience to God's word. Amen. To the creator of the universe, the one who loves you and longs to give you the true desires of your heart. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not the desires of your sinful nature. Delight yourself in the Lord. Spend time in his word. If this is your only dose of God's word throughout the week, will lie for you in your eulogy. <laughs> like, <laughs> seriously, like, <laughs> we can't put it nicely. I mean, <laughs> like, it, it, two plus two is four. You're not spending time in God's word. You don't know God's word. You don't know what the Holy Spirit's leading you to do. Oh, I think, I think the Holy Spirit's leading me to divorce my husband. Wrong. <laughs> seriously. If you don't know God's word, how can you know what you're even supposed to be obeying. Oh, God told me. No, God, you don't have any idea what God's telling you if you don't know his word, if you're not spending time in his word. Trust me again, guys, it's not money or cars or women or pride or instant satisfaction that you're truly after. Those are simply the avenues that you think will get you there. The avenues that Satan wants to offer you. But they won't work. What your heart truly desires are the fruits of the Spirit. And I can guarantee that you can have them if you will simply go straight to the source and follow him. Now a couple questions that I thought of while I was studying this that I, I, I would ask, I think, if I was sitting where you're at is, when is disobedience okay? It depends on the source. What are you disobeying? Disobedience to God's word, when is that okay? Uh, never. <laughs> It's like saying, when can I no longer breathe um, when you no longer want to live? <laughs> but to, what about other sources? Disobedience to the government, when's that okay? When it says to disobey God's word. That's the only time. Until then, God's word says to obey the law. 
Now, something that um, God's been putting on me, and this might be a little bit aside from obedience, but when we disobey. Conviction versus condemnation. When you disobey, guaranteed Satan's going to be right there. You idiot. You did it again. You're worthless. You're such a loser. You're going to always be like this. You're a sinner. Right? Anybody heard that? Every single time. That's condemnation. Condemnation focuses on the person. You are an idiot. You are worthless. You are a sinner. You will never be worth it. Conviction from God focuses on the action. That was a stupid move. Shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't cheat on your wife. You shouldn't do drugs. Never once does he call us the fool or the idiot. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 with me real quick. Switching gears just a little bit, but we're almost done. I just, I want to get this because I, I, I think if we don't get this, we will never make that transition from, obedient, or from disobedience to obedience. Because we'll always think, no matter what I do, I'm just always going to be stuck in disobedience, no matter what I do. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, at this point, Paul has sent a letter to the Corinthians um, for their disobedience, right? Pretty heavy, hard-hitting letter convicting them for their disobedience. And uh, in verse 8, you, you can see just by his speaking, and it also says above it, but he was kind of feeling bad for sending that letter. It must have been pretty harsh, right? So in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8, it says, I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Guys, that's Satan saying, you're a loser, you're a bum, you're a sinner, you're never going to be good enough. That's not conviction. That's condemnation. And I know it, it, he's really good at disguising it as conviction because we think we're being humble, right? Like, yes, I'm so humble. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> the problem is, is, in saying, I'm such an idiot or I'm such a sinner, your eyes are still on yourself. That's not humility. Humility takes your eyes off of yourself, puts your eyes on Christ, and says, you know what? God created me. I'm not an idiot. God didn't create an idiot. And this leads to labeling yourself as your sin. You're not an alcoholic. You're not a coke addict. You're not homosexual. You are a child created in the image of Christ, intended to return to Christ, being lied to by Satan, and being convinced that you are your sin. You're not. You're a child of Christ. You're not an idiot. And Moses and I were talking about this today. This is a little bit risky. You're not even a sinner. You sin. You commit the action of sin, right? God didn't create a sinner. God created a child in his image intended to return to him. The Bible says you are co-heirs with Christ. Sinners aren't co-heirs with Christ. God created you. And I know that we in this church have talked about it for a long time, you know, we, and I, I still hear people walking around saying, I know I'm still a sinner. It's like AA. You go for 40 years and you still walk in the door and say, Hi, I'm Kyle. I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in 40 years. You're not an alcoholic. You're a child created in the image of Christ who struggled with alcohol, who still needs to stay the heck away from alcohol, but you're not an alcoholic. Amen. Don't label yourselves as your sin, guys. Because what you do when you label yourself as that You've always heard it. When you, if you raise a child saying, you're a loser, you're a loser, you're a loser, guess what? The child's going to grow up and he's going to be a loser because he's going to obey what he's been programmed to believe about himself. He's going to do the things that line up with being a loser. 
And when you say, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, guess what you're going to do? You're going to obey. You're going to continue to obey that sinful nature. That is not who you are. That is not what God desires for you. He has given you the Holy Spirit not to keep you somewhat free and somewhat still under this oppression like Moses said. Don't let us get back under this oppression. Stay free, guys. Stay free. Free to receive the leading of his Holy Spirit. You are not your sin. You don't have to obey that anymore. You have the power. Now, if you haven't received Christ, then you don't yet have that power. And I know somebody here who is getting baptized tonight, and that's awesome. Because guess what? From now on, he has the ability to not obey that sinful nature anymore. If you have not done that, and I look, everybody's done that here. You guys have the power to overcome your sinful desires. Do it. Receive it. Receive Christ. Each and every time. Take up your cross daily. You're going to face the trials. It's not just get in the tub, get out, and then you're a holy zombie. No choice. I, yeah, the Bible says to become slaves of righteousness. But that's a process. It's an everyday decision. Uh, uh, every single day, every decision that you make, it's always on the table. Let's pray. Father God, um, we know that this sin thing, that you had to allow that. Because without that option, it wouldn't have been true love, Lord. It would have been forced. So we don't hold that against you, Lord. Not that we have that position ever, Lord. But we recognize right now that that sin thing, that was an option so that we could show we truly love you more, that we truly desire your way instead of our own, Father. So Lord, we pray tonight that, that you would convince us uh, of the value of obedience to your word, convince us of the value of your word, and therefore obedience to it. Father, destroy the voice of the enemy in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, we pray that you would turn up the volume of your voice and turn down the volume of his voice, Lord, so that we would be no longer slaves to sin, but instead slaves to righteousness. No choice but to just do what's right because we know that that's what you want and that that's what you're leading us to do. Father, we pray for just an overwhelming filling of your Holy Spirit, Lord. just destroy the, the wickedness in our hearts, Lord. Encourage us, Lord, when we would rather just lay down early and go to sleep or when we would rather just spend time watching TV. Lord, encourage us, remind us of the value that your word has over those things. Again, we, we're constantly seeking joy and peace and the en enemy constantly wants us to think that it's in watching TV a little bit longer or going to bed a little, little earlier or in this drug or in that girl. Or... Lord, help us to hear you when you call and scream to us. No, it's in my word. It's in the leading of my spirit. And we just pray that you would do that for us each and every day and that we would be faithful to do our part, Lord. Give us great faith. Give us great strength to obey who you are and what you guide us to do. Lord God, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.